This morning's scripture lesson comes from the book of Haggai, chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. And it reads, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are never warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, and the, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehazadik, the high priest and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. This ends the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Can we be in an attitude of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would use me as an instrument here this morning to speak to your people. Give us your word. Speak into our lives, not just theirs, but mine as well, so that we can hear what you have to say, what you call us to do, and that we can go out and live it to truly be the light in this world which you call us to be. This we pray in your heavenly name, Lord. Amen. How many of you here this morning like constructive criticism? Raise your hands. One person? Two? Eh. <laughs> Not sure. Some, some threw them up, some threw them up, then right back down again. Okay? How many of you absolutely loathe criticism? Raise your hands. One honest person in the front. <laughs> now, for those of you that welcome criticism, you probably recognize that construction criticism, in the long run, though it may hurt, can be a good thing. It can be a good thing. As Eric Roy points out in his article, positive criticism can open and set your sight to higher levels that you may not have been thinking about before. It can help you to recognize your blind spots and knock you out of a daze. Once you identify these areas, then you can work on these blind spots and have, high, and have higher chances of achieving success. So criticism can be good. However, as we saw this morning, some of you just are not sure on what you feel about criticism, and some absolutely hate it. And that's what we see is that people in this world today just don't like criticism. Why? 
Oh, because they don't like the way that it makes them feel. In fact, some people downright fear criticism because it makes them feel like they're not good enough. Like they're being rejected. Like they're being judged for who they are. But what if that criticism came from somebody that you adore? Somebody that you really admire? Somebody that came into your life and changed your life for the better? Somebody that not only changed your life, but saved your life? Of course, I'm talking about God. As God at times, can be hard, but criticizes us and the way that we live our lives as Christians. And this is what the people of Judah faced on August 29th in 520 BC, as the people of Judah were more concerned about their own lives, their own comfort, than rebuilding God's temple. So God used the prophet Haggai to deliver a message of criticism, a message of encouragement to the people of Judah. So if you would like to follow along with me this morning, I don't know if we'll put it up on the screen, or you can, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Haggai chapter 1, beginning with verse 2. And this is what we read. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Why were the people of Judah saying this? Why? Well, as we said last week, they faced opposition from their enemies because they were rebuilding the temple of God, which we can read if we backtrack to Ezra chapter 4, verse 4, which says, Then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This opposition, as well as another future opposition, forced the Jews to stop building completely. As discouragement and fear came over the Jews from the setbacks and the standstills and the threats and all those other things. So the temple remained unfinished for 10 straight years years. And it was during this time that priorities began to slip and bad habits began to take over. The Jews became more concerned with their own personal comfort than giving of themselves to God, more concerned with pouring their time, talent, strength, and resources into their luxurious houses instead of pouring it into God's house. That is why God sent this message through Haggai to the people of Judah, which we read in Haggai chapter 1, verse 4. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Or as the King James Version puts it, is it time for you, O yea, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? In other words, God was calling out the people for putting up a veil. As the Hebrew word for sealed is translated to cover, to veil, to protect. So the people of Judah were basically ignoring the work, God's work that had to be done by rebuilding the temple and focusing on themselves instead. Last week, I asked two vulnerable questions. One, is God truly a priority in your life? Is he number one? Question number two, if he is, is it reflected in the way that you use your time, your talent, your strength, and your resources? Now, the reason I asked these two questions last week was because it was found in a survey that Christians are just too busy for God these days as our schedules are jam-packed with work, with school, with family activities, with taking our kids to sports, with 
taking our kids to clubs that they're involved in, among many other things. Now, some could use the excuse, there's just too much to do and not enough time to do it. And I would raise my hand, because I'm guilty of this. I say this a lot. There's just too much to do, and I just don't have enough time. Or some may say that I just lack scheduling skills. However, what it really comes down to is what is truly important to us. What is truly important to you? What is truly important to teach your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? Because as I said last week, Michael sees everything that I do. He sees everything I do. He does the, and he reflects that in his activities, whether it's good or bad. And if we don't teach our children values, if we don't teach them that God is first before anything else, they will grow up and reflect that in their own personal lives. And unfortunately, we see that prevalent in many churches today, including this one right here. Now, I understand that being a parent isn't always easy. We want to support them in their activities. We want to be there for our children, cheer them on to success, but we also need to lead them in the right direction. And that right direction is towards God and his work, that they come first before anything and everything else. As we are called to give God our first, our best, not our leftovers. So going back to our scripture lesson, picking up with verse 5, Haggai continues. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. What God is describing here is a drought, a famine, that when we exclude God from our plans, our lives, and focus on our own interests, our own comfort, we become spiritually dry, spiritually ruined. Basically, we reap what we sow. As I said last week, Jacob's church currently finds itself at a standstill though we do see some promise already happening. As we search for our next senior pastor, as we search for our next music director, as we search for a purpose, for a direction for us here at Jacob's Church. However, during this standstill, we can't allow ourselves to be pulled in several different directions. We can't allow ourselves to become divided. We can't allow ourselves to be pulled completely away from the church. We can't allow Jacob's church to become spiritually dry. We need to come together as a church as a body of believers, as I said in my children's sermon, we all have a part to play here this morning. Each and every single one of us have a part to play. What that part is, I don't know. I can't give that answer, but I have been praying for months and months and months for God's guidance, and I believe that it will come to fruition. We will see it. But we have to be patient. But God has a part to play for each and every one of us. All we need to do is take the ground that God has given us here at Jacob's and till it, water it, plant seeds in it, fertilize it, all according to God's plan so that we can reap the harvest together. 
there have been many great moments throughout Jacob's church history. And maybe you've been here during those times, and maybe you haven't. But there are many more to come. And so during this standstill, we can't feel defeated or fear for the future. Instead, we need to put our trust in God. Then God said through Haggai, picking up with verse 7, Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of the heavens, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. What God was basically saying here to the Jews was, you have a very important decision to make. So give careful thought. If they, if they chose to go to work and rebuild the temple, God may take pleasure and be honored in it. But if they chose to go on living their lives without obeying God's commands, God would continue to withhold his mighty blessings. We too have been called by God to get back to doing God's work if we choose to obey. He may take pleasure and be honored in our work, but if we choose to go on living our lives without obeying God's call, God could withhold his blessings from Jacob's. And I know this is hard to hear, and nobody wants to see this happen. But the end, Ch Jacob's church history, could be done forever. The doors could be locked and closed forever. I don't want to see that. And I hope you don't want that. I want to see the church flourish. I want to see the Holy Spirit working in each and every single one of your lives. I want, I want us to truly be the church that shines forth for Jesus Christ. I want us to be brighter than ever. That is my hope and prayers for this church, whether I'm here or not. That is my prayer. I want to see this church succeed. And I don't want to see this church just stop at the four walls. I want to see this church go out into Nutripoli and shine forth for Jesus Christ. I want to see this church go forth into Lehigh Valley and shine forth for Jesus Christ. I want to see this church, Jacob's church, go throughout Pennsylvania, the United States, the world, and shine forth for Jesus Christ. That's what I want to see. This isn't about me. This is about Jacob's church and God's plans for you. And so I pray and hope that God will give us a direction through our Wednesday nights as a group so that we can move forth and truly give our best as a church. Now the people of Judah could have attacked Haggai after he delivered this message of criticism. And one may not understand that. Because as I said before, we don't like to hear the negative things about us. However, picking up with verse 12, we read, then Zerubbabel, son of Chiltiel, and Joshua, son of Jozadik, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed 
obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then the Lord said through Haggai, I am with you. A brief message that was comforting and encouraging despite the obstacles that they faced. See, God has a message, that same message for us. As we face a standstill as a church, I am with you, says the Lord. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe that? If you do, buckle your seatbelts because we're about to go for a great ride, an amazing ride, and do some awesome things here at Jacob's Church. He's going to do some mighty works through us as we give him our time, our talent, our strength, and our resources. You will be amazed as you look back when a new chapter began here at Jacob's Church, and you will remember the day that we were in this time of standstill, but we put our faith in God, and we trusted him every step of the way, and he did amazing things, not just here at Jacob's Church, but in each and every single one of our lives and all we could do, all we can do, is praise God. 23 days later, Haggai's first message, after Haggai's first message, the people of Judah began to rebuild the temple. temple. And we read this picking up with verse 14. So the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. When? On the 24th day of the sixth month. They remembered. They remembered when God stirred the hearts of the people and they went right to work rebuilding the temple. Now it may be hard for us to go right to work because we don't know exactly what work we're supposed to be doing. But I pray and hope that when we figure that out as a church, according to God's plans, that you will obey. That you will give your time, talent, strength, and resources to serving God here at Jacob's Church. That you will make God a priority above everything else in your life. So first, what I'd invite you to do this coming week, pray. Pray. Because we can't do this without God. None of this is possible without God leading us. At the same time, pray and ask God to reveal to you what he wants you to do. What does he want you to do? What role does he want you to play? And maybe it's a role you've played already, or maybe it's something that's out of your comfort zone, but God's going to use you to do something great here at Jacob's Church. Secondly, go to the Wednesday night Bible. I guess it's not a Bible study. It's a meet and greet. I guess it is a Bible study. Go to the Wednesday night when we start having this. Be the church. 
come together to discuss, to learn, to discover what God's plan is for Jacob's church so that we can all be excited for the future, for the things that God will do. Folks, it's time that we come together as a church and give God our first, our best, and not just our leftovers. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would truly speak to us during these Wednesday night get-togethers, these Bible study. Speak to us and show us exactly what it is that you want us to do for your church. Make your plans our plans. Make your will our will so that we can do your mighty work that we could rebuild here at Jacob's Church and become one once again. I pray, Lord, that you would be working in the lives of the people here as they go throughout their week. I pray as they pray to you and ask you to reveal to them what it is that you want them to do. You would show them. I pray every step of the way you would show all of us how we can serve you because that is our purpose as a church to first and foremost serve our God whom we love. Thank you, God, for everything you have blessed us with and may this continue going forward into the future. This we pray in your heavenly name. Amen.